You're listening to South City Radio 94.4 FM with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, on the Friday Sports Show, bringing you all the news from around the world and the local area. We're very fortunate on this show to have world-class sports people, footballers, people from all walks of life in the world of football and even beyond. And they give us an insight into their role and what they do. And one of the things we aim to bring you on this show is one, we look to increase participation and awareness of different sports, but also look at roles that people have around the world. And it's really fascinating. We get guests from around the world to talk about what they do and and, and, and their roles. And today we've got a really intriguing uh, guest who's going to give us an insight in terms of what he does uh, abroad. And it should be fascinating to to get more of an insight in how he got there and what he's doing out there. So um, Rob Rowles, who's the who's a national coach at the Bangladesh Football Federation. Rob, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Great, Jimmy. Thanks for um, inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure to chat to you. I just hope the internet connection holds out for us while we, uh, we get through the questions, mate. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Rob, so Bangladesh, it's, it's interesting, really. I mean, talk to us about your, your experience in the UK. There's, our listeners are probably wondering uh, how you, you sort of work towards be, becoming a coach in Bangladesh. I, I know you had experience in the UK at Port uh, Vale. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, I was, a, you know, probably the best way to just just kind of give the backstory very quickly is that I was a classic kid, um, was interested in nothing but football, um, you know, wanted to to be, you know, whoever it was in the nineteen seventies who was scoring goals, a great Brazil team and, yeah. and Liverpool and all the rest of it, and um, I got as far as the crew youth team. Um, as a kid and um, dad pulled me to one side and the college teacher and said listen you know I think you better get an education um, so I did um, and, and kind of um, you know like, like the majority of people didn't uh, uh, didn't make it as a player um, I could run and, and edit but you know um, as regards doing anything silky um, I had to leave that to other people Jimmy so yeah, yeah. I thought well you know if I can't play um, how am I going to get in the game I said I want to be a football coach and um, my dad said and the college teacher said, there's no money in football coaching. I wow. thought, oh, what am I going to do now? So I said, well, can I be a physio then? And they went, yeah. So based on the fact that I thought I'd get into football, I went to be a physio. And um, long story short, uh, yeah. I've worked in and out of the game as a physio. And I've worked at um, you know non-league, league, grassroots. And you know, been very fortunate and worked with... Uh, Premier League worked at Everton I was um, at a physio at Everton had a wonderful wonderful time I was at Stoke City um, and at the England set up um, been to World Cups and Euro Championships and all kinds so and then but I've always coached at the same time um, non-league and the kids and, and universities and and, and um, about 10 years ago I thought you know what I want to focus on the coaching so I mm. went back and redid my badges and, and, and went through the UEFA stuff and B licence and A licence and, and all the rest of it and um, did that and um, I was coaching at Port Vale uh, in their academy wonderful club um, really punchy above the weight great people and um, just got a call out of the blue from uh, a guy called Paul Smalley who was a technical director at Bangladesh Football Federation English guy who I knew from the English FA um, when I worked uh, with the England squads and so on. And he just said, I've got, a, got an opportunity. Um, and, you know, that, that was just how it came about. And my yeah. kids have grown up and got their own way. So I was kind of in a great place to take Absolutely. up an opportunity. So um, came over, Jimmy. Yeah, that was yeah. kind of how it came about, really. That's very really interesting. And you mentioned there that you want to be a footballer growing up, and a lot of people do. And a lot of people do, do want to be a footballer. It's a global game. And what I find interesting is that, okay, so you set off wanting to be a footballer. Um, maybe don't sort of uh, get to the level you want to get at in terms of, you know, I suspect you want to go to the, to the very top. And But you sort of get to the top as a physio. And you could, you could make the point that, okay, there's no substitute for being a player. A coach is probably uh, next best thing in one respect, but depending on what part of your career you're in but to be at the top as a physio and then to sort of go through the coaching did you have any sort of doubts yourself Rob in terms of you know you'd obviously got to the highest level as a physio do you ever think well maybe I'll just sort of stay and work at the highest level as a physio or was it how, how did it feel to go into coaching and sort of start again type thing 
You know, it's a great question, Jimmy, and it kind of gets to the heart of who I am as a, or a part of who I am as a person. But I mean, it's such an insightful question because this is things I've only discussed with kind of very close people, my sister and, and my dad and one or two other people. So, um, yeah, I was very blessed in my career as a physio and, and you know, I don't know, I, I did have a chance for it. I had a kind of way, it just seemed to be something don't get me wrong I work my socks off like you do it, it, it what you do you know you have to put the hours in yeah. and uh, I was blessed and I, I you know I worked in as you say as high as you could go and I, I got to I was what in my 40s um, had a you know don't mind saying it you know had a, a marital breakdown um, mm. you know and hold my hand up and say I wasn't in a good place for a while um, and and you know I thought blimey am I just going to carry on doing the same thing so it came at the same time as that and I, I, as you say got to okay without you know trying to to the, to the top level in terms of where I wanted to be and I thought well I could, I could, I could tread water Jimmy for the next 15-20 mm. years but this coaching thing that I'd been inside me since I was 18 was eating away at me, Jimmy, and it was eating away at me. And I stood in dressing rooms week after week, season after season with managers, and I'm thinking, I could do that. That's wrong. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Oh, I agree with that. And, and uh, you know, and I, I, I had to do it, Jimmy. You know, Maslow said, you know, we have to be what we have to be. Absolutely. You know? um, Absolutely. And I had to do it. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, so... I, I went back and, and they said, no, you've got, you know, so I had the old um, prelim badge and uh, I said, well, can I just move on from that? I said, no, you've got to go back. So I completely down to tools. You know, Jimmy, it was a reinvention. Um, yeah, it was a reinvention. Of, and, 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 and at that age, Jimmy, you know, I, I bless my family for giving me the support to allow me to do it. Um, but I went back to nights out night to nights and Tuesdays and Thursdays and cold nights and, and grassroots yeah. and because you got to do the time again you know if you believe in the 10,000 hours you got to do 10,000 hours again and something else and yeah so I did it and um, I'm still doing it and um, you know that's, that's kind of how it and blimey some doubts flipping heck I, you know there's been some dark times mate I mean yeah you yeah. know um, but, but hey that, that's life and uh, it's only the trials that, that, that kind of get you to you know and um, blimey I'm still on the journey like we all are, mate, and um, I'm really, learning every day. It's really interesting, Rob, because for me, the physio in, in a football team, and I've always seen the physios, obviously the, the, the main role is to get the treatment of players from injuries and so on and so forth, but I've always seen them as like a pastoral role as well in the sense that players tend to confide in the physio probably a bit more than, than maybe yeah. other coaches because obviously they're in a position where if they're out of an injury and and also I suppose a physio is more neutral than some of the coaches but did you find being a physio helped you become a coach as well sort of almost like an education where you sort of you communicate with players one to one and it can be quite intimate in the sense that you know they're telling you what's going on in their, in their life type thing and how they feel about the injury yeah. and, and that sort of stuff was it a, a good experience from an educational point of view being a physio to prep you for being a coach I think it was massive um, I mean if you look back uh, you know at the history of some great managers and I know the, the term physio is banded about and before they had physiotherapists they had trainers the trainer you know the old yeah, trainer yeah. kind of thing and yes the, edu- the educational thing was different in those days but Bob Paisley was, was a trainer you know um, yeah. and some um, what the great Arsenal manager I think it was uh, uh, was, was, a, was a physio and you know Nigel Adkins was a very renowned physio mm-hmm. and you know uh, there's, there's quite a few if you look back at the, so it's uh, you know the Tranmere guy was a, was a physio the Tranmere manager a while ago so it's not like um, you know that there's never been anybody yeah um, and and you learn so much about the game anyway because you're in the industry and you're in the mix and you see how it all works you've got all that and, and you are able to stand back and you are able to kind of see what goes on without being in the melee yeah. if that makes sense because you're yeah. kind of just outside the technical department yeah. and you do get Jimmy you've hit a big thing you know you get players come and lie on your treatment bed yeah. uh, especially the ones who are out long term um, I mean I could tell you, blimey, I could tell you stories, Jimmy, uh, and, and, you know, yeah, yeah. people, if I, I wish I, I wish I could tell you the names just because <laughs> but some of the, I've yeah. got a couple and they're both, both at, 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 at Everton and, and, and 
one of them is probably one of the most famous players that, that this country England's ever had and uh, you know um, yeah. he, he he just wanted to come and live with me because he said Rob he said and this isn't about me Jimmy it's just because I was that person at the time it could have been you if you were the video then it would have been yeah. you do you know what I'm saying it's not about yeah, me yeah. It, I just happened to be the person in that job role he said I just need somebody and I know with you I can be myself because I can't be myself with anybody else in the world because everybody wants a piece of me for who they think I am and I'm not that person yeah that's, um, that's incredible uh, fascinating yeah uh, and, uh, another guy who who uh, was on his knees when I just went to the club because of circumstance and it took nine months but we spent nine months together uh, and this guy rehabilitated and built himself up again and I was just a little part of that journey and and you know we wheeled him out on the grass after nine months and he was this giant of a man yeah. and everybody couldn't believe what had occurred under their noses but it's, they couldn't see it while it was happening and uh, and those are the things Jimmy that, that that if you're lucky enough to be in an arena where you can connect with, with people yeah, and it create that outcome for them uh, yes. and it does give you that special thing particularly one to one when the door shuts it's you it's them it's six o'clock at night and everybody else has gone home yeah then then you do get the nuts and bolts of, of, of me and you and you and them kind of thing which actually the that's the connection that, that makes the magic work, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's powerful stuff, and I think it takes a certain type of person to be able to do that. And I think, you know, certainly in my experience, Rob, where working in football, sometimes we'd have work experience people coming along, and I think they, they like the idea of being a football physio, a conditioning coach, a mental skills coach, a psychologist. But when they sort of really, really felt the nuts and bolts of, of doing that, they realized that it was the idea that they thought what football was like, but not the reality. You've, you've sort of touched on a really important thing for our listeners who think of football from a player perspective, but people like yourself are working all hours, and it's a privileged job, don't get me wrong, you know, we, we love the game, but the reality is that there's a lot of hours that you put in, and, and, and you never really switch off, Rob, to be fair, you're always sort of thinking in your own mind, and you know, the injuries and, and injury prevention, and, and also, did you ever, as a physio, I think what I find quite interesting sometimes is that the media has sort of changed and you've got social media and like for example you see certain clubs they pick up a few injuries and people sort of weigh in with what their thoughts are did you were you ever in a situation where you sort of you sort of hear things and, and I mean I, I've known certain people in the game and I've heard certain things said in the media about the way things are going on in training at certain clubs and People generally, you know, they don't, they don't sort of obviously, you know, it's, it's not their job to understand, but they've got, obviously, if it's got an opinion, but do you, do you ever hear stuff like said about training, um, you know, there's a certain club this year, I'm not going to mention who they are, but a few people are sort of pointing the thing of why they're getting a number of injuries, um, but looking at some of the reasons people use, obviously, you know, there's a lack of understanding of anatomy and physiology, but what's your take on that these days? Everyone seems to have an opinion on the way things should be done in training at a club, and that's sort of extends to almost everyone's remit yeah 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 absolutely I think um, the the advent and the growth and the evolution of social media where very little is private let, let me just give you a I could, let me let's, it, it's it's merciless for for professionals particularly health care professionals because let me give you you know two examples one of them and this was something 10 years ago um so I'm working in the game and I'm working with elite Premier League players and they then take the ball because they, especially players who aren't in their own country. So you're working with yeah. foreign players. So you're in England working with people from France and Portugal and Africa, maybe. If you're injured, they want to go home, Jimmy. Yeah. So they, they'll within half an hour of getting an injury, they've got their agent ringing three surgeons around the world for an opinion yeah, yeah. and you, you, you can't you lose control and time yeah. passes and you, you know you're trying to import and you're trying to lead it and you're trying to do it but actually there's just so much that goes out of your control um, and, and I've seen that 
and been involved in that wow and that's a difficult um, thing to manage Absolutely. another one on that working on an international working on the international stage okay so you're training you're working on an international camp the media's there not even the media may, maybe one or two media but, but somebody goes down injured and it doesn't look good yeah. somebody in the crowd immediately a parent a brother a sister a family member a friend immediately messages on social media Twitter or the club and within two minutes there's a frenzy that you can't, you're not aware of while you're actually still in the acute stage of dealing with that person on the pitch mm. there's already things going on to move to find out what's going on it's already in the, it's already spread and you know it, it's already getting bigger by the second and you haven't even got time to assess what, what's going on and that's that's how uh, what it's like uh, uh, in, in in top level football um, absolutely yeah. that, that's a really powerful uh, insight uh, Robin one thing that sort of interests me from the physio point of view and obviously you know I'm not going to name names or teams or anything like that but just seeing it from your experience did you ever find there were players that for example Rob that they're on the they're on the sort of payroll type thing and you think well this injury is taking a, a, a bit longer than I mean obviously players want to be out there playing predominantly you, I'd, I'd make a case for maybe 99% of players want to be out there playing but these days obviously the pay scale for players is a lot different than it used to be did you ever sort of find yourself in situations where you thought well actually you know what you're probably good to go now but in, in your case was, was that not, not the case did you experience it? Yeah. Um, no it's a great question and it's very insightful and uh, I have worked with players who uh, would will. What can I say? Okay, so you could have player A and player B, and that you could have an identical injury. The difficulty with that is that uh, how the, it's not. It's never about the. It's not just about the injury. It's about the perception of the injury, and and, and you know, it's all about how the player filters it and what's yeah. their interpretation of the injury. So the difference is a subjective one from their point of view. Yeah. If they, you know they say what what the definition of pain is whatever somebody says it is so person A says it absolutely it's a 10 out of 10 on a on a, a visual analog scale if, I don't know if you understand what that's but like we do a 0 to 10 tell yeah. me what your pain is 0, 0 yeah. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 one player will say it's 10 of course one player yeah. say, say it's 3 well you know in their mind one's massively severe and I've got I can you're absolutely right Pl- a player will say no I need some more time I used to have players come in I had players come to me and say, "Look, I'm telling you that I only I will only be playing 18 to 20 games a season." Wow! <laughs> Saying that, yeah, because I want my career to last. You know, wow. and you're you're thinking, I can't believe what I'm hearing here. Yeah, and you know, yeah, you know, I've had a player say that to me. That's incredible. Uh, That's fascinating. And and come in, you know. Uh, and, and you know, the, the, you know, how do you deal? How do you legislate for for that? Because their agenda is that you know, if they've got the slightest discomfort, they're, mm-hmm. they're not going to risk anything. Now, some people will say, well, how can you blame them if they're going to if that's going to extend their career by three seasons, and they're getting you know so many hundred thousand pounds a year can you blame them um, yeah. I'm not judging on whether you can blame them but I've got you know example you know yourself all the players they'll they play 38 42 45 games a season um, and never never darken the physio's door yeah. um, absolutely uh, but that's that, that's 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 what dealing you know working with uh, people does it you know you'll have yeah. all kinds of characters and um uh, that, that's that's you know that's how it is in, no, that, in a group it, of people, isn't it? Absolutely, it's really interesting. Our, our listeners are probably wondering: is that obviously the the question around dealing with players that are on that sort of money and the, uh, yourself? Obviously, you sort of you've been in the game for a long time, and you've seen the transition in, in in finances in the game. And I think our listeners are probably wondering in terms of how obviously the manager is one thing, but someone in in, in a various role, be a conditioning coach, and I've been in situations, Rob, for example, where I've had. You know, heated conversations with players about kicking footballs about before they've warmed up and 
you tell them once, you tell them twice, and then you can avoid, obviously, uh, certain injuries, impact injuries that are beyond our control, but warming up can help with certain injuries. And in terms of you got a £100,000-a-week player, for example, how challenging is it to one second you're sort of treating them on a table and you've got rapport and they're telling you about their family and, and so on and so forth and you sort of have a conversation. All of a sudden, you've got to be really firm with them and train them and maybe you've got to say, you know, you're, you're staying back after the game to do some training to catch up in your fitness and they just want to take off home or you want them in the gym tomorrow or swimming. And what's it like for the listeners to, to, to work with these players um, as a physio that are on huge amounts of money? Um, I think probably just to answer the question, Jimmy, and another great question. I think it's really important. I think, uh, first of all, there's a little bit of back story to, to, to the question. I think footballers, on one hand, get a, a bad deal from the press and from uh, yeah. people who are outside the game because they are Very blessed point. with skills that allow them to earn financially a lot more than you know people who work a nine to five blue college job if I can yeah. use that term you know and I think it's unfair um, to brandish you know and say blammy you know because they earn so much money um, they should act in a certain way yeah. but you know it's 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 inevitable that you know um, players who are earning a lot of money um, and, and are in privileged positions um, sometimes you know are, are in such a situation that you know they they are under so much pressure to to, to, to do certain things to act in a certain way to have an image you know mm. this, this kind of thing relates back to all this this mental health things that, 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 that's going on that you as a, as a professional in the game just happen to be a pawn as part of the process and you know dealing with people is a challenge for all of us I think I think in yeah. any walk of life it's all, it's all about the relationships we have and how we relate to ourselves and how then that creates relationships with other people. I think it's certainly magnified, Jimmy, mm. when you are in the pressure pot crucible of professional elite football with individuals who are in in that bracket of you know superstardom and, and, and earning a lot of money and, and, and images and, and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, the answer, I think, is you have to learn that you are a member of staff first and you have to have an authority in order to create the right outcome because it doesn't mean you can't be a friend. It, 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 it's about creating a relationship of trust whereby you... you the player knows that they can trust you but at Absolutely. the same time you have to have ha, it has to be known that you are a member of staff and you know what what you want uh, has to happen and, but it's in the interest of, of, of the player you know so mm -hmm. um, listen then there will be confrontations it, it's you know inevitably you know, and this is something that I had to learn. I I, I had to learn it. Um, to, blah, I mean, the learning curve is massive, no, very very steep. Absolutely. The thing uh, is, that you, you've got the, the obviously dealing with the manager and other coaches too, and the players as well. And did you ever feel like any any pressure from from management or coaches as well, uh, Rob? I've seen myself sort of firsthand. I don't know if you experienced it, but from me, from the outside looking in, I've seen situations where the manager and, and physio haven't had the best I wouldn't say they haven't had the best relationship but obviously it's, it could be a strained relationship in the sense that maybe the manager sort of wanted the player back earlier the physio thinks it might take so long and how's that in terms of for, for our listeners just giving them an insight to what it's like to deal with with a manager yeah. for example yeah, listen uh, you know another fantastic question um, I, 
can honestly say, hold my hand up and say I've worked with some absolutely amazing, amazing managers, some some great, great people. Um, yeah. And I've got the ultimate respect for them as people, as human beings and as, as, as professionals. Um, I've had what, one where... Uh, the, the situation was it was a difficult relationship um, and so much so that the manager in question ended up uh, getting somebody else involved to actually treat the players because I, my diagnostics and my therapeutic inputs weren't considered to be correct. Wow. Um, I found out about it and uh, went to confront and I, I went into confrontation after a thought process because I thought this is the, this is going to be the end this, this, but I have to do it because you know my professional personal integrity and putting my head on the pillow at night time I just can't sit here and allow this to occur um, because I know that I'm right I believe that, that, that uh, you know so I went in and had the conversation and um, to be fair to the person, within an hour of having the conversation, which took a lot of courage from me, I remember I was shaking going up the stairs to, to have the <laughs> conversation because I thought I was going to be asked to leave. Yeah. Um, they came into the office, said can I have a word and said and apologised. Um, wow. So it's, it happened once um, uh, and, you know, it was really difficult. But... You know, I, I, I hear, I've, listen, I've, I've heard, blimey, I've spoke to, uh, with, there's a network, obviously, and you, you, rec you know, when you're at clubs, you, you know, you know all the physios, you know the coaches, and when you go, yeah. you know, you know them and you speak to them, and you know, blimey, um, there's some horror stories of, um, of things that go on because uh, people have opinions, and, and, you know, ultimately, a manager wants to play a back quickly, and sometimes, if they you know they're under pressure themselves yeah you know they they, they they obviously feel the need to try and get that time away from the player reduced, you know but um yeah, and no, I think the thing is too, Rob, I think that, you know, for our listeners as well, and you, you, I think it's really interesting, you've been sort of honest and upfront, and it's really, really good in terms of, for them sort of understanding. And I think the other thing too as well from a manager's perspective is say, if you've got a player injured, it's difficult, the budgets are tight at different levels of the game, and it's not always easy if you sort of work maybe in, in the lower divisions where you've got a player obviously being paid who's injured, and it's hard to bring someone in, and you're under pressure, and you're fighting relegation, and it can be pretty difficult and, and, and tempers do flare and absolutely in the game and I think the important thing is when, when these things happen to sort of to, to you, you go again and, and not take things personally and, and this is sort of the way it is and have you sort of been and experienced yourself sort of environments changing rooms that have sort of I wouldn't necessarily say exploded but, but you must have you been in situations yourself where things are sort of flared up and um, in, in, in in football environments, yeah, of course. I think, look, you know, you know, Jimmy, and and you whether it. Okay, I think there's there's football and the show business, isn't there? And, and yeah. you know, I think they've got similarities. The fact that from the outside, everybody wants to get in. Absolutely. And yeah. When you're on the inside, you realise, you know, it's not it's not the pretty picture that that it's painted to be. It's hard. It's brutal. It's demanding. And it's pressure, and yeah. when when it's when people are in hard, demanding, brutal, pressurized situations, you, you find all the weak spots and the vulnerabilities in all of us. That it brings it out, you know. So, as soon as you or I walk into that situation, um, and if a manager's there and he's lost two games and he's going to lose another one, and he's got you know the chairman breathing down his neck, um, he's not going to be sitting there. Smoking a Panatella cigar, thinking, yeah, yeah. doesn't matter, I'll be on the beach tomorrow. He's, he, you know, he's likely to be on the edge. Um, players who are coming to the end of the contract, there's so many things in the mix. And yes, I have, of course. Uh, but 
you know <laughs> these are all great media stories aren't they and I've got nothing to offer that, that's that's um, you know but yes I have and yeah. um, you know it's just boys men uh, tempers lost um, you know Absolutely. yes things things being knocked off you know uh, and, and you know <laughs> all the rest of it and you know boots thrown and yeah you know we've Absolutely. all heard it um, and, and you know it happens I'm not saying it happens now I'm not, I don't know but um, yeah, I've been no. there and you know everybody's you know I don't uh, but I mean, you know it's just, just, it's just frustration it's normal human emotion and um, you know um, yeah, it happens yeah that's yeah, a good point I think it's for our listeners and people who are considering going into football who work in football yeah, from amateur right through to professional it gives them an insight in terms of what it's like and I, I can fully appreciate having had the opportunity of working in other environments and other professions as well that people are under pressure whether you're a teacher health there's different types of pressure say health service different types of pressure but I think the pressure in football is, is unique in the sense that it's kind of all eyes on a new type thing and everything sort of gets scrutinized and I think that's a different type of pressure in the sense that football means a lot it brings out emotions in people it's quite tribal as well and people do feel it's a results orientated business you're only one game away from being called all sorts of names and or one game away from being the hero so there is that but sort of reflecting on Bangladesh the role you've got there Rob that's quite fascinating in the sense that Football in terms, I mean, I, I don't know a great deal. I'm not sure the listeners know a great deal about uh, football in Bangladesh. Obviously, cricket, um, they're, they're an established team in cricket, got a very good team, a very competent team. But what's football like in, in Bangladesh, Rob? Um, for, uh, you're spot on with, with your assessment, really, Jimmy. But, um, obviously, you know, cricket's a massive thing here. Football is kind of like. I suppose it's like the girlfriend. So if you call crickets the wife, and and, and, and fact, that, that's not my my analogy. That's one of the the guys who from over here said it. Cricket football's like the girlfriend. So yeah, yeah. Um, everybody kind of has a has a has a eye for it, but almost dance say that they kind of you know. Um, it, it's Bangladesh is a country of a hundred and something like a hundred and seventy million people. Wow, and it's got. Uh, a thronging, thriving young population, um, yeah. and there is more potentially than you can shake a stick at. Um, people are hungry, um, and it's got potential to die for. What it hasn't got enough of, and they know this, and they're working towards this, which is why they've got the English coaches in. I'm not saying that you know because we're English, but they've gone and invested in. in the, you know, English coaches and, and so on, um, is that they want, they need a better infrastructure so mm-hmm. that, like in England, kids or kids have the opportunity to play grassroots football and, you know, five sides and small sided and, and go in little leagues and lads and dads leagues and yeah. mums and dads support from as low as you like now, eight, nine, ten, you know. And yes, there's opportunities for street football here, but it's not kind of like the, favelas of Brazil in terms of that there's not mm. you know the old goals at Glasgow that Willie Donicky talked about kids playing football all the time there's not enough of that there's some but not enough and it's there is a lack of opportunity yeah um, it's hard here in terms of life for people in general the majority you know people are working hard 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 to earn a living and, and um, you know uh, yeah. uh, so kids need opportunities and then what we're trying to do is put things in place to get grassroots programs uh, considered um, get money put into it so that you know over the next 10 years you've then got your, your, your kids who are 6 and 7 now who will be 17 and 18 and who, who mm-hmm. hopefully would be coming on and being um, the next generation but um, you know, the punch above the weight look the, the, yeah. the national team are about 180th or 180 something in the, in the FIFA rankings which is yeah. you know low down um, but they punch above the weight, um, uh, you know. All you know, we talked about the, the, the Premier League in, in the UK with so many foreign players. Well, here they've got a Premier League, and, and all the Bangladeshi strikers find it very difficult to play regular football here because the, mm-hmm. the teams buy in and pay big money for you know 
strikers to come from abroad to play. Um, yeah. So we've got the same problem here, kind of thing, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, which is strange. But um, it's a great, uh, a great place to be, um, and um, you know they, they've got masses of potential, as I say. Yeah, and absolutely. And I mean, I find people, the people I've met from, from Bangladesh are quite proud people. They've got good athletes in terms of the, the athletic ability. We, we see it in cricket and we see the athletes as well. Um, the, 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 the strong, uh, people and, and strong minded people. Now, from, from football perspective, do, do they qualify through, through Asia? Uh, Rob, what's the qualification path for the World Cup for, for Bangladesh? Yeah, so you, 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 you go and the local, um, you know, you play your your, your other nations close to you, and then obviously you've got to you've got to qualify through the Asian um, AFC, and then get your pathway that way. And as I said before, you know, Bangladesh are a, a relatively small fish. Um, what what you see, you're seeing a big growth in Asian football. Um, yeah. Obviously, the Japanese have taken it very seriously. Qatar have taken it very seriously South Korea have taken it very seriously and the common denominator with those countries is the developmental structure and infrastructure and the financial input Um, and you cannot get away from the fact that you know it doesn't seem that having a great football team is just going to happen it's not just going to happen it has to be created and the pathways have to be created to allow and facilitate Absolutely. that process to occur. And those nations have done that. Um, and, you know, Bangladesh is, is moving forward. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it, it will take... Um, uh, you look at the Qatars and you look at the Japanese and you mm-hmm. look at the South Koreans and you can really see... Um, what what they've done and um, you know absolutely yeah, yeah that's what that's what we think needs to happen yeah, but you know they've invested in coaches and stuff so uh, it's really interesting Rob because I sort of think back to Japan and and the J League when that first began and we look at Japan now and and they're a, a tough team to play against they're, they're always very competitive at the World Cup you look at South Korea as well their professional league and they beat the likes of Germany in the World Cup and I suppose you see now the, the Chinese league and the Indian league as well getting investment and it's getting more higher in profile you know certainly China's getting more and more players going over there uh, India too in terms of the um, Bangladesh is it, what about the Asian Cup is, 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 is there a possibility they could maybe qualify for an Asian Cup because I sort of there could be a, an option for them to get onto to, to the big stage or yeah yeah you know um, again um, you've got to you know they've just got to probably go another level um, mm. you know um, and you know we the, the last game we um, last couple of games have done really well against Qatar and India you know without um, winning the games um Played really, really well, um, and Jamie Day, who's the head coach, Blam, he's done a fantastic job, and uh, you know Eddie by Stewart, and um, so we've got Bobby, Bobby Mims, who obviously is a very well-known goalkeeper yeah. from from the UK, who's out here, and uh, you know these guys are doing a tremendous job, and um, we just probably need to just go another level up, and, and, mm. and then maybe things will, will will just go to to the next level. Um, yeah. But uh, you know that, that's the reality of where we are, really, uh, Jimmy. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I look at, at Thailand and Malaysia; they seem to be improving too, and some of their results. Uh, aren't just one-offs now. I mean, some some teams they could do uh, a one-off performance, but it's getting that consistency, which is the key. In terms of the the league in, in Bangladesh, how would you compare that? I'm not yeah. able to compare, but as as a general yardstick, where would you say the the league would sit in terms of say maybe the, the, the English league? Where, I know it's difficult, obviously. Uh, yeah, it is difficult. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, I hate to be. Blimey. Um, you know, I watched a game last a uh, couple of days ago, did a report on a game a couple of days ago in the Premier League, uh, the Bangladesh Premier League, and it was a real good game. Play, teams tried to play, short pass in, tried to do the old penetration, and, you know, a great structure from... Uh, so, you know, blimey, that was a... I don't know, where would you put it? You'd probably put that as a, I don't know, a League, league One... Uh, you know, borderline championship, the English championship, you know, but wow. I've seen all the games, you know, <laughs> uh, where 
the game's so stretched and you you know at times it's difficult to work out what formation you're playing because the discipline's not quite there and, and you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the shape's not quite right so you kind of then look at that and think well you'd probably get a, a, a real good league two side would would walk we would walk the game at times you know because of the discipline and, and their, their their shape and, and their their pressing and, and, and things like that so you know it's a little bit varied I have to say um, yeah that's, that's interesting that's what, yeah it, it's you know uh, it's it's probably somewhere around 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 that kind of level if that makes uh, yeah, no, I think that's, a picture, that, Jimmy. You know, that's, that's an interesting point. I think that sometimes it's easy to overestimate uh, or underestimate anyway. And I've, for example, I've spoken to people in, who, in America and they've suggested that the MLS is probably uh, some teams are on path, the Premier League. But I went to watch a game last year and I think that <laughs> I, I don't I don't share that opinion. I, I think over there, it's like he says, it's difficult to gauge because some they might be competitive for some periods of the game, but to consistently play that level week in week out would be tough and it's always hard to compare like you says and that's really interesting for our listeners in terms of the, the, the variation obviously you can set a team up and they can compete over a period of time but over a season I guess it's, it's a tough thing but what about in terms of the people in Bangladesh do they follow the Premier League and English football I mean English football is huge around the world and do they sort of have a, uh, a follow some of the English clubs yeah, absolutely, and you know, blimey, you know, you out here, everybody. As soon as you know you come from England, it's like everybody tells you who their favourite team is. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's obviously, it's obviously either Liverpool or United or no, it's but ninety um, percent of the time. But they love, they love English football here. I mean, you actually get better coverage out of the English Premier League out here than you do at home because um, you can see it streamed live. You know, if you're if you're in on a on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock, which is nine o'clock night time here, um, you got the games coming on. They, they, they show all the games, the great coverage of the English Premier League, and massive analysis programs about it, and they show it in the week about the best games you know blimey so coverage is great people love it always talking about it massive appetite for it and um, of course the, you know, there's a Bangladeshi community there's a good few of them in, in England so um, yeah. I think they keep in touch that way and um, no it's great to see it from outside the country and how it's received and you know I think we should as a, a, an English person we should appreciate the fact that if we didn't have this kind of support and appetite for it it wouldn't be the game it is because um, the money wouldn't the money wouldn't flow so um, it's, it's great that's and a we great need to, point we need to yeah and that's an important kind of, point though, for sure and in terms of the, 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 the footballers there do they have aspirations of maybe playing in Europe one day or the UK do they sort of see it as being a, a, an option I mean I suppose that would do a lot for the game in, in the sense that being being back if, if, one, if a player from Bangladesh got taken on by like other countries do I guess a bit yeah. like say Song at um, at, uh, yeah. at uh, Tottenham is that sort Tottenham, of yeah, yeah. Well, it's something that, that, that you know, say Jamie and, and Stuart and um, obviously a guy called Andy Turner is out with us and he's trying to get some initi- initiatives going. Um, we're keen to get some initiatives going to give the Bangladeshi guys um, and some opportunities. There are barriers, some, a few barriers in terms of um, travel and money and visas and that kind of thing. You know, I'm not an expert in all that, but it's yeah. not as simple as just, you know, right, get on a plane and go. Um it's not as not quite as simple as that but um, yes we're trying to instill that do you know what I've kind of found um, here or we found here is that the players here almost haven't got they almost need Jimmy this Mm -hmm. is how I see it they almost need one or two players to actually go yeah yeah. and and, and make it to break that belief wow Exactly. Yeah, but it's like it's like the it's like the crabs crawling out of the jar, yeah. you know. Until the, the, the one Roger gets Bannister out. effect, the four minute mile where he, he breaks it yeah. type thing, and then you've got everybody else. Um, yeah. yeah, and yeah. it's almost like they're a bit happy. They're a bit happy playing in their own country, and yeah, I think some go to one or two go to India because yeah. it's a little bit more competitive there. Um, uh, you know, well, it would be great to have a pathway. And start to see some of these lads 
because yeah. technically they're good and they're willing to learn um, as a nation they, they're not the biggest nation in, in the world physically so they're not six foot four mm. majority of them but obviously you know what does that matter if you're a good player absolutely um, some of the best players uh, you. Absolutely. Yeah, so you know I think it's one of the things we would like to facilitate and um, it would hopefully just kind of put a little bit of petrol on the fire here and think people think wow you know I can actually go and uh, make a mark um, I mean, just just on that, the the the, the captain Jamal, um, he he has played in Denmark, so it's not an unknown. It's not that it doesn't happen. Um, it just needs to happen more from from our point of view. Um, would, it, would it like attract, say, for example, the the the, the in, from a demographic point of view? Would would it sort of would would a club that I mean, if they if a club say in the UK, Europe, or wherever, uh, had, took a player on, would it do a lot for the game in the sense that the the, the following, the the team, for example, do you think would sort of have a have a you know be a big factor? And let's say, for example, a club from the UK takes on someone from Bangladesh yeah. as a player, would that then sort of entice uh, people to support the club, like has happened with with other players? In different absolutely, countries? yeah, I'm sure, absolutely. In the media, you know. The media here are all over everything um, as regards football. You only have to breathe and, you know, there's a hundred journalists who want the story. Um, so, you know, it's not a quiet backwater of football in terms of the media. The media are hungry for yeah. anything to do with football. So something like that will be a catalyst. Um, and, you know, to ju- just to start some kind of regular... Um, exchange program where a club's actually got a bit of belief in Bangladeshi players and can see and there's a, there's a you know um, yeah so that kind of thing Jenny would do the world of good here and um, it would be something we'd uh, we'd love to see yeah I think also like from the, from a club perspective in terms of for for certain clubs also uh, abroad it's, it's it's good for them and you know, obviously clubs aren't going to recruit unless they they recruit just on the basis of getting media and, and and selling shirts and that sort of stuff but that must cross the mind from a commercial point of view obviously uh, a player who's going to command a big media presence and, and commercial merchandise for certain players is huge and to be honest I've got to admit Rob I've been surprised over the years at certain clubs maybe maybe not the top clubs obviously they generate revenue from TV and, and so on and so forth but I've been a bit surprised sometimes certain clubs that they've not sort of looked into that more and that's just been my observation I thought well if you're a club say in the championship or, or, or even league one you think well it's worth sort of casting the net to, to far and wide and if you sort of can recruit a player from say you know Bangladesh and then the media gets back there and just raises a profile I would think as, as a club and obviously I can't speak for, for the chairman and managers and coaches because yeah. why don't I do it and like he says the complications in visa and, and that sort of stuff but it, it must be a good idea is it because maybe the players aspire to play at a higher level or what sort of would, would they consider playing at maybe a more moderate level to build their way up or because I've known players yeah, I think so yeah. I think it's a little bit multifactorial I think you know it's almost like like you say as soon as it happens um it's not, nothing's a good idea until it's happened, is it? It's yeah. like it's a bad idea until it becomes successful, and everybody thinks it's a good idea. So, um, I agree, Jimmy, that it would be great for every in every aspect. I do think, as I go back to before, I think that the the, the, the players have still got this belief that they're not quite good enough. As a, as a, I don't mean that I can't speak for them individually, yeah. but you get the feeling that they're a little bit tentative they haven't got that actual fundamental died in the wool belief that they can take the world on which I think sometimes to go to a foreign land mm. you have to do yeah. um, you know it's not just about going and playing football it's about adapting to a lifestyle leaving your family and you know in this, these parts of the world family is massive I mean, yes, you know, yeah. the culture is is enormous um but people are hungry for success too so you know I, I concur with everything you say um, yeah, I think if it was easy to do you know it would have been done by now um, we just yeah. need just, it's not it's not not going to happen I, and I, I hope it will um, on, on a more consistent basis and I just think 
we need a way to try and facilitate it where you can get a belief from the from the clubs in England and go, wow, you know, there's some potential there, and yeah. a belief from the people here who yeah. think, wow, I'd love to do that, and also from the the federation point of view to say we need to be doing something to help our young players and provide them with financial support or whatever it is so that they can go to Swindon or they can go mm-hmm. to not Forest or they can go to wherever and and, and, that, and go for eight, six or eight weeks. But, you know, just, just on that, there is a, a project at the moment. We've got six boys um, who are going to Manchester City for six weeks. Six yeah. Bangladeshi boys going yeah, yeah. on a, sponsored by um, a big company. So there is that going on. And obviously, yeah, I think, you know, I don't know what what the outcome is going to be, um, and I suppose if any of them show any potential, there might be some possibilities. But um, you know, it's, that's, it's that's a step in the right direction, absolutely. I absolutely. Mean, if you you got to be absolutely. up to win it, and it's a great opportunity. I think it's win win all round. And in terms of giving the opportunity uh, for the players, it's, it's it's a great opportunity for for a club in the UK, obviously for Bangladesh to raise the profile of football. There, we saw a sort of in cricket. I think many years ago, if you sort of thought Bangladesh in cricket, it was. I wouldn't say an easy fixture, but you expect it to win. But you think cricket, the last World Cup, they, they were contenders to get out of the group and they, they provided to be Brilliant. tough opposition. So we've seen cricket players in Bangladesh now playing around the world. That probably wasn't something people envisaged in, in, in the beginning. But if it could happen in cricket, then, then why not in, in football, so to speak? But uh, no, really, Absolutely. yeah. And, and yourself, Rob, how have you sort of settled to, to, to life in general? Obviously, football is a, is a leveler. Wherever you go in the world, I think football sort of common ground and in terms of yourself yeah. sort of um, you know life in general in, in Bangladesh has it been a, a unique experience for yourself I think it's always good for a coach in my opinion to work in different countries and learn different cultures and that sort of stuff but what's the experience like being for yourself um, from, from a living point it's, of view it's been a, a, an amazing experience um, you know it, it, you, you think yeah I'd love to do that and then, you know, the reality hits you that actually you are making a decision to go thousands of miles away from your family yeah. into a culture you've never been into before. And, you know, it's a phenomenal experience. It's been a phenomenal experience. Um, we, we live in a hotel, so we're in a, we're in a hotel. We're, we're very well looked after. We're in Dhaka, which is the capital city. It's busy, 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 almost 24-7. The traffic wow. is unreal. Um, there's people, people are everywhere. There's a massive commercial nation in terms of businesses going on. And, and you know, look, that, that without... Um, pulling any punches there's you know some of the di- difficulties with, with, with the economics for, for people who haven't got jobs and and things I think so, so you know you, you do see um, people on the streets that, that's um, well that's life um, you have to deal with that um, we boys who've come along to play um, are hungry blimey they hang on to every word Jimmy you know I've coached yeah. in the UK obviously I've coached here and is a world of difference, I have to say. Um, you are valued. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm being blunt, and this is the truth, you know, in, in one respect by the players, you are valued so highly. They listen to every word you say. They take everything on board, and they really try. Um, and it's a, it's a different level of intensity in terms of their willingness to, to do what you they're trying to bring them to do it on the pitch and, and so on um, which is great absolutely great um, you know the food's is something you adjust to but you know we're yeah. well looked after and um, we, we get driven around because it, you, I mean, you, you, the best driver in the world you'd struggle here because <laughs> it's just um, get, yeah. getting around um, and the weather obviously in the, the certain times of year is ridiculously warm and humid so you, you're hydrating all the time and you have to watch that um, you know, but um, you, sometimes you, you say you get a bit homesick. Not not homesick in terms you miss you don't see your family so much, and you just keep in touch on Skype and all that, which is a blessing because um, yeah. or FaceTime or whatever you call it. So it's great. Um, the culture's different. It's 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 heavily dominated by the the, the Islam, and, and and you know you got the call to prayer five times a day, and people, you know 
players will put their hand up and say, excuse me, I need to kind of go and pray now. Is that okay? And you just say, of yeah. course you can, you know. So you've got all that, which is, that's life. That's their life. It's their, their you know, and before games in the, in the dressing room, you set a separate area up for prayer. Um, and things are worked around that, you know. Um, yeah, no, but, that's, a, um, that's fascinating uh, insight for our listeners for sure, Rob. And, and you know, myself, it's just really fascinating sort of hearing you speak because I think we sort of sometimes we sort of see players, and, and equally from from the point of view, sometimes it sort of gives people an insight that players who do come from abroad to the UK or, or across Europe, and it takes time to settle in, and, and values are different, cultures different, and sometimes I think it takes a season or two uh, for for players to sort of uh, bed in as well too in terms of the new environment um, that sort of you know shows that yeah. it, it takes time and I think yeah. one thing I do take away from what you're saying and I mean the key thing is for any professional going anywhere um, and certainly I've had the opportunity to interview many professionals working around the world I've experienced working around the world myself where you embrace the culture where you are and that's a big thing I think if you can embrace it learn it then that goes a long yeah. way towards um, making life just adapting to the situation and, and, and enjoying it too it's, 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 I think enjoying it is the key thing but we sort of think of, of people working in sports in different countries and just look at the sporting side but there's a, there's a big process in settling in as well like you've mentioned uh, which is, which is yeah. fascinating stuff Rob but it's been fascinating I mean time's gone really quick Rob it's incredible I'm, I'm sure the listeners have really enjoyed listening to what you've had to say uh, about your own career as a physio and how you've sort of progressed well I wouldn't necessarily say you could call it progression you sort of made the move across to, to sort of coaching and it's been fascinating to hear you speak about uh, uh, you know Bangladesh uh, and, and football there and, and where it's going and that's fantastic uh, to hear so I want to thank you Rob for coming on board the show the, the Friday Sports Show with myself Jim Petruzzi South City Radio we wish you every success uh, in the uh, in the future, and, and we'll keep an eye out for uh, Bangladesh football and see how things go on. Thanks for for joining us, Rob. Been been great uh, speaking to you. It's my pleasure, Jimmy. Thanks to you for inviting me. It's a great honour and um, all the best to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So you've been listening to Salva City Radio, ninety four point four FM. The Friday Sports Show of your host, Jim Petruzzi. We've had the pleasure of speaking to Rob Riles, who's coaching at the moment in Bangladesh. And what a fascinating insight he, he gave us into life in Bangladesh on and off the field, but also his own experiences and his own journey from being a, a player to becoming a physio and working to the very highest level. Um, do feel free to drop us a, a, an email via our Facebook page, The Friday Sports Show, uh, any questions or comments comments on anything that we covered this evening or any other show for that matter as well uh, and make sure that wherever you are wherever you're doing you have a fantastic weekend and we aim to increase participation and awareness of sport from the local area and around the world um, it's been a pleasure having you all listening to the show and until next week the Friday Sports Show, 6 o'clock on your dial, 94.4 FM, South City Radio, 6 p.m. The Friday Sports Show with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi. Have a fantastic weekend and we'll speak soon.